It's a blessing to have you here today, and for the last few weeks, it's been a succession of one-day messages, a message for a day that might be a message for the long haul, because that is, that is the reason our, our sermon series over the last few weeks has been entitled One Day, because everything can change in just one day, and yet we can't base our lives alone on just a day. So we together have been exploring the book of Obadiah, and maybe it's a book that you never explored in the Bible. Maybe it's a book you never read, or probably there are a lot of you who never even heard of the prophet Obadiah, and that's okay, because there can be a continual revelation and a discovery process as we engage God's word on a deeper level. Now, we've, we've in, a, in a very short span of time, we've actually covered a lot of ground. And it would be hard to, to give you the full context today in the time that we have. In fact, each week it's taken uh, you know, a little bit more effort and a little bit longer to, to give you the context and to sort of situate Obadiah's prophecy. So I want to encourage you to go back and and watch or listen to the last two messages if you didn't have a chance to already. And I want to thank those of you who have been here the last few weeks, who are still here, who are still coming in what can be a difficult book of Scripture to experience because what we've learned already is that Obadiah is the briefest book in the Old Testament. It's short in scope, but it packs a powerful prophetic punch. Can I get an amen for alliteration there? Okay, thank you so much. I didn't know if you were actually going to do that, but I appreciate that. There's a lot that happens. The, The minor prophets are very specific in their prophecy. So in part one, we looked at and we talked about that when hardship comes, we can let the Lord fight our battles. We ourselves don't have to be the ones on a solo adventure of justice, but we can allow God to intervene in our lives and in a situation. Let the Lord fight our battles. And then last week, we talked about the fact that hurting happens, and we talked about why it happens, and we actually channeled a New Testament prophet. We channeled James the brother of Jesus, in his New Testament letter or book, when James said, come near to God and God will come near to you. That's what we can do when we're hurting. Today, we're going to be spending time in the very last section of Obadiah, just the last few verses, talking about how hope arrives and what that looks like. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like hope itself can be hard to find. In fact, I want you to, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to see what the first thing is that comes to mind. Where do you find hope? I'm wondering, and I think it may be true that the first thing you think of is not the news. <laughs> The media. It's probably not watching the evening news. That maybe for some of you it is, but for most of us, it's not the evening news when we think of where we find hope, where we're thinking, you know, when I when I catch the most updated, the most recent headlines and news of the day, that is where I find hope. Man, that is that's what feeds my soul. <laughs> that's what nourishes me. In fact, you know the the sort of the news mantra or slogan, if it bleeds it leads, right? Well, I think the same is operating below the surface, that if it hopes, it hides. There's so few big stories in the news that are just full of hope, right? We have to kind of sift through the headlines and the stories to really find them, to find the stories of hope. In fact, a news channel or many news channels that you watch on television these days, they have one hopeful story, sort of maybe at the very end, 
You know, they've, they've saved the last two minutes for something uplifting because I want you to come back and tune in the next day for the next episode. The news is probably not where you go to find hope. I think maybe another place you may or may not have thought of, but I think maybe you didn't, is social media. Is that a place that came to mind when you thought of where you find hope? I mean, again, for a few of you, it may have. But so often when we look at social media, we can see people that may be obsessing over one thing in particular, or maybe closer to home, maybe on a deeper or a more personal level, we see people's highlight reels, all the good things that are happening to them, and we compare that to our every day. And we're thinking, well, gosh, you know, I'm not living my best life. I mean, I look out and I see my friends or I see these people that I'm connected with on social media, and everything just looks so good. And it is, and it does, because it's a highlight reel. It's not the every day. And so I think social media, while it's so wonderful to be connected to one another across a long distance, and we can catch up with people and connect with people, but at the same time, it can leave us feeling inadequate. It can leave us wondering where we can find hope. But maybe for my faithful Jesus followers this morning, the first thing you thought of was the Bible. And I want to say amen to you, okay? I want to give you a, a, you know, a pat on the back and say yes, that is so true. But then a few of, a few of you, you know, when I say hope and, and, I, and I say the Bible, you might say, well, that depends on where you open in the Bible, that depends on what part of scripture you read, if it's really going to be hopeful. Because maybe you've read a portion of scripture before and you've been kind of scratching your head, you know, thinking, I don't know, where's the hope in this? One of my best friends is, his name's Adam, and he's a pastor in New York City. And we were at Princeton Seminary at the same time. We actually graduated together. And we actually kind of, we deepened our friendship, ironically, when we were both interviewing for the same position out of seminary. <laughs> we kind of met and we kind of discerned together, sort of an unusual coming together, but that's where our friendship really deepened and took on a new level of connection. He and I both had several preaching classes with uh, one of the most well-known homileticians, which is a fancy word for preaching professors. Dr. Clea LaRue is an African-American professor at Princeton Seminary who's been there a long time. He's written many books, very influential in the church in helping to raise up and train up pastors and effective preachers. Most anyone that could wanted to have Dr. LaRue as their preaching professor, and then maybe also for another elective, which Adam and I were both blessed to be able to do. Adam recounted to me just recently a story of how he was given in Dr. LaRue's class a particular text to preach for the class. It was from the Gospel of John, chapter 7, and it had to do with Jesus' brothers. It was a conversation, sort of, between Jesus and his brothers about this big festival that was coming up. And his brothers were encouraging him. They were saying to Jesus, you know, you need to go. If you're doing all these amazing, wonderful, miraculous Messiah things, you need to go and be seen. I mean, why would you want to hide this and keep this back from the people? And Jesus said, you know, it's just, it's not my time. You know, I, I'm operating until, under the radar until the time is right for my true identity to, to be revealed to everyone. Now, what it says in John 7, verse 5, is this. It says, and this is how bad it was for Jesus at that time. It says, even his own brothers didn't believe in him. 
where is the hope in that? Though, after I thought about it a little further, I can see how, for Jesus, even though he is the Son of God, but he's also human, it would probably be a pretty impossible task to convince those in your family that you are God. I mean, imagine trying to do that yourself, trying to convince someone in your family that you are God, that you are the chosen one. Not an easy task despite all that Jesus could do. So Adam stepped up and he preached this sermon and he, he felt okay about it, but he just he tried to, to preach the authenticity of the text. So it wasn't a particularly uplifting message and he just sort of said it like it was. He said amen, closed his Bible, put down his preaching notes. And the first thing that Dr. LaRue said in response to Adam's message was, Adam, where was the hope? Where was the hope in your message, in your sermon? Adam sort of, you know, reluctantly said, well, I didn't, I didn't really see any. And then Dr. LaRue went on to say, you have to find the hope and preach the hope. Hope can be hard to find, but it's our call, our charge to discover it, to uncover it. Maybe that's what you've been thinking as we've been journeying together through the book of Obadiah. Maybe you, like I was at first, have been wondering where is the hope? Well, the good news is today we're kind of, we're getting to probably the most hopeful part of this very short book. We're going to be looking at just the last five verses. Let me just say a few things. We're looking at verse 17 through 21 of Obadiah. And if you're thinking, which chapter? Again, like I said, there's only one chapter. So it's just verses that we're looking at, okay? Uh, Let me say a couple things as you're finding that in your Bible, or don't worry, it'll be on the screen as well. Uh, at the very beginning of Obadiah's prophecy, it says that, that Obadiah received a vision. And if you're someone who really likes to pay attention to what words mean and what, is that, what does a vision entail, a, di- a vision is insight from divine revelation. Insight from divine revelation. That's what the Hebrew word for vision means. So Obadiah is a channel for God's vision to God's people. Insight from divine revelation. The thing we haven't talked a lot about is that we actually see this kind of prophecy in other prophetic books. We see other prophets speaking a similar message, which, just to bring you up to speed, in case you haven't been with us over the last few weeks, Obadiah is prophesying judgment against Edom who are the descendants of Esau. There was some sibling rivalry uh, that took place between Jacob and Esau, and, uh, and things kind of went off the rails. While they eventually reconciled, this book and Obadiah's prophecy speaks to where Edom fell short as a brother to Israel, where they weren't upholding their part in this familial connection as God's descendants. So up to now, the first couple sections that we've looked at, we've looked at the hardship that God's people face. We looked at the hurt they encountered, the Israelites, and now finally, we're getting some hope. So we're going to begin at verse 17. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, and it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will drive out those who drove them out. The house of Jacob will be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau straw. They will burn them up completely, and there will be no one left of the house 
of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the arid southern plain will possess Mount Esau, and those of the western foothills, the land of the Philistines, they will possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. Those who remain of the Israelites will possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and those left from Jerusalem who are now living in Shepard will possess the cities of the arid southern plain. The deliverers will go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. What's unique about this prophecy in this promise is that it didn't take effect immediately. So often we're wanting for God to act on our timeline, aren't we? But from the time, as we talked about last week, from 587 BCE, from the time of the destruction of the temple to finally seeing justice upon Edom, it was about 100 years. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that might, all, might that, that might not seem all that long, but for you and for me and for God's people, that probably felt like a long time to see justice happen. But it did. Justice was realized. And the truth here is that God always delivers on a promise. God always delivers on a promise, a promise of restoration, a promise of justice. Because in the end, justice was realized, but it took a century for it to happen. Sometimes waiting to see God's promises requires patience. It requires us to be able to pull back and trust an all-knowing, all-loving God, a God who is with us at all times. You heard in the first verse, in the last verse, you heard Mount Zion. This is something you'll hear reference to in other prophets. Mount Zion, historically, meant a few different things. It meant the city of David. It meant the Temple temple Mount. And now it means sort of the western hill in Jerusalem. It's a sacred place that those who have escaped will gather back on Mount Zion. The deliverers will return to Mount Zion. You know what that is? That's that's a kind of home for hope. But what's so unusual about it is that place in the world is one of the most conflicted places. And yet, scripturally speaking, prophetically speaking, it's a kind of home for hope. And why is that? What would lead us to think that, it's because of the last verse of the whole message, the whole prophecy from Obadiah. It's because Obadiah says in that last verse, because the kingdom will be the Lord's. Anything that belongs to the Lord, and by the way, that's everything, can be a place of hope. It's not because of anything great God's people have done in ancient times or even now us as the church sitting here today. It's not because of anything good like that, but it's because of the goodness of God that we can have places that can become hope in themselves, places like like a church, like a sanctuary in which we are gathered, this in itself can be a home for hope. And you know, when you enter the doors 
of a sacred space, of a home for hope, even without knowing it, even without being fully aware of it, your spirit can be lifted. You see, Obadiah is, is turning the page to hope, and yet the people in the story aren't fully aware that the page is turning. It can be the same in your life, too. God may be about to do something in your life, and you might not be aware that's, that it's even about to happen. That's why we've been talking about, for this series, we've been talking about how do we hold on to hope for the, for the long term? We want to talk about it one day at a time, but we want to hold on even when the next day feels like we're a little further from hope than we were to start with. So what does it look like when that hope arrives, when that thing that we've been praying for, hoping for, and seeking for finally happens? What might that look like? Almost two years ago, I told the story of our daughter, Hadley, who's four years old now. When she was just two at that time, I told the story of how when we were down vacationing in Florida, we were at a pool, and with some encouragement from her grandmother, she got up onto a diving board, and she was sort of escorted by her grandmother, and then I had I'd gone out into the pool, I swam out right underneath the diving board, and she worked up the courage to jump off, and I caught her, and she felt so good. And that was a wonderful sermon illustration for that day. <laughs> And that worked so well. And then we, kind of, we got out. What, what I didn't talk about at that time was we got out of the pool. We're getting all dried off and ready for lunch. And, you know, she stopped. She has these amazing one-liners. You know, young kids seem to be able to do that. Like Obadiah, they can just pack a powerful prophetic punch, and you can just be stunned with something they say. So what she said was, Daddy, one day I'm going to do that on my own. One day, I'm going to jump off the diving board by myself. And I thought, well, wonderful. <laughs> That's great. And I'm sort of on to thinking about the next thing. <laughs> I'm on to thinking about, you know, what we're going to do that afternoon. But she didn't forget. And so that summer, last summer, she was, she was kind of talking to Sarah and I. She's like, I really want to do the diving board. I want to, I want to jump off the diving board by myself. And so Sarah... When we had some friends in town, took her to the, the pool, and she was feeling great. Hadley was feeling great, and she got up on the diving board. Sarah's right beside, you know, this would be kind of a new thing. She, she could kind of swim decently well. You know, Sarah figured she had hoped she would be able to make it to the side, but just was right there in case she needed to intervene. So Hadley worked up the courage. She kind of, you know, sort of stepped off the edge, splash into the water. Only problem was she wasn't coming back up. So Sarah, in her clothes, she didn't have her swimsuit on at that point, had to dive into the water, kind of bring her back up. She was right there the whole time, so wasn't too concerned. But that was a little traumatizing. You know, we, you can think how, you know, she's like, I don't want to, I never want to jump off the diving board. I, I, that, that just, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> but thankfully, we have relatively short memories. So fast forward to this summer, and she finally gets an opportunity to do this again, and with some encouragement, and I'm sort of standing on the side where Sarah was. She swims even better now, so we're a little less concerned about her drowning, but she gets onto the diving board. I'm saying, there's a kid who just went in right ahead of her. I said, look, just like him, you can do it too. You can jump off the diving board by yourself, and she got to the edge. She was looking down. She started shaking her head. And I'm like, yes, yes, Sarah. Sarah's like waving, like, you got it, you got it. And she said, no, 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 no. Couldn't do it. <laughs> All this build up. And of course, Sarah and I were like, fine, well, we're, not, we're just not going to try it again. If you're not going to do it, we don't really, there's a lot of effort to what I do. And then she kind of gets down, and we go back to the kids' pool. And a few weeks later, she says, Daddy, I'm ready. <laughs> Want to try the diving board? And I'm like, OK, fine, sure. But I'm like, hey, Sarah, do you want to take her 
you know, do you want to just take her to do the diving board? And so Hudson and I are sitting across the pool, and you know, Sarah takes her over to the diving board. And, you know, I was across the pool, but I could kind of already see that there was a different look in her eye. <laughs> she had the eye of the tiger, okay? I was feeling like this really could be the moment. Sarah was standing right beside her, right next to the pool. And this time, there was no hesitation. And this is what it looked like as I sat across the pool. She made it happen. She's not here, but I'll tell her that you were very happy for her. <laughs> she felt so good. That day, hope arrived for her. That thing that she had been hoping for, designing for, probably even praying for, it finally happened. What is that thing for you? What are you holding out hope for because I think it's good to know. <laughs> it's good to know what you're holding on for because that can keep you going. Today could be the day that God shows up and changes everything for you. Maybe you've been waiting and wondering if hope will ever arrive, but I want to tell you, today could be the day. I want to encourage you to live with a kind of holy anticipation. If I had to define hope, that's what I would say it is. A holy anticipation. Living on the tips of of your toes for what God is going to be and to do next. So often we're, we're sort of sitting back, we're sitting across the pool from the action. And I was happy to, to capture that moment when I did, but even on that video it was a little bit hard to see because I was so far back. I had given up a little bit I mean, I figured at some point it would happen. But I could, have been, I could have been right there. I could have been right beside her. You and I can live with a holy anticipation. God can do more in one day than you can do in a hundred lifetimes. Because we serve and we worship a God that created the ground we walk on in a day. In a series of days, God created all that there is. And I think that that is something worth placing our hope in. And if nothing else, if you take nothing else away from this message, it's that when you live with a holy anticipation, you allow God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. That is what Jesus did when he came into the world. When he took the, the burden of sin, when he took the burden of of brokenness on his back. And he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. When Jesus brought hope in, we could allow him to do what he was born to do. And when up to that point, it didn't look like there was much hope to be found, he came and he embodied a holy anticipation. And it's that. It's Jesus. Jesus is the, he's the hope 
of the world. So if nothing less, we can build our hope on him and live with holy anticipation. Amen.